I just wanted to welcome you to the keynote presentation. Um, it just occurred to me, I don't really know the origin of why we call things keynote. So something to look up. Um, but keynote presentation of the uh, More Than a Manifesto, the Poets Essay Symposium. If you are just tuning in now, we are very happy you are here. Um, so far today, we have heard from nine esteemed poet essayists, Wayne uh, Kestenbaum, Ken Chen, Ariel Goldberg, Tracy Morris, Raquel Salas Rivera, Anais Duplan, Myungmi Kim, Cecilia Vicuña, and Brandon Shimoda. Each of these poets have responded to the prompt of the symposium to create or comment on the notion of a poet's essay. So far their attempts, as Montaigne would say, have all been astounding and have come in the form of too many things to list in full. But I'll give just a few highlights if you are just coming here now. Um, they talked about trips to the underworld and transatlantic capitalism, the poetic as a caption, Crocus as a potentially cheerful scapegoat or something else, um, a manifestation school, the relationship between heart, mind, and spirit as potentially a manifesto essay and a poem, the crisis of experience and the reality of experience and beauty, August 10th, 1988, linguistic genocide, and a bombo genesis and the red flat snake. One valuable takeaway from today, I would hope, would be that the poems and essays can be places, that both poems and essays can be places to test out ideas. And maybe another important space we have opened up for poets is that they can write prose freely without worrying that their work must be a manifesto, that it must be in defense of their art. Instead, I hope that we have begun to open up the ideas that for poets, the essay form can be a place to just be. I invited all the poets who have spoken today for obvious reasons, and I asked Fred Moten to speak to you all tonight for obvious reasons, too. Moten is someone who so distinctly employs both forms, it is hard to tell often when reading him if you are reading a poem or an essay. Certainly, we could say that we are experiencing both. As we have thought about today the term essay from French and the original conception of the form from the definition is meant to be a place to test out ideas. It seems as if Fred Moten writes an essay as a place to test out a poem and a poem as a place to test out an essay. It could be that he's simply writing one form, one new form, and that's one of the many, many reasons he makes us so excited to read him. Because for many writers, the essay is a place to explain everything, and the poem is the place to explain nothing. But for Moton, the poem itself is not the hard object that is difficult or even impossible to understand, and the essay the lens with which to form an understanding. Instead, working both against and with modes of scientific investigation and methodology, Moton makes the poem and essay places to use in part his terminology, break in to each other in an endless loop of tension and acceptance to bear the weight of one another and fortify a never-ending strength, infinity. So before I share um, Fred's bio with you, uh, I want to take a moment to thank again our sponsors for this event. Thank you again to the Lenfest Junior Faculty Development Fund, the Heyman Center, the Dean's Office at the School of the Arts, the Writing Program, and of course, everyone at the new and beautiful Lenfest Center for the Arts. I just want to take one last moment to thank Gavin Browning for everything. Um, thank you to all of our presenters for being here and sharing your work. We simply couldn't have gotten here without you. Fred Moten teaches in the Department of Performance Studies at New York University. His latest work is Consent Not to Be a Single Being from Duke University Press. He and Stefano Harney are authors of All Incomplete, which is forthcoming next year from Minor Compositions, Auto, Auto No Media. In 2018, Moten received the Roy Lichtenstein Award from the Foundation for Contemporary Arts and was named a United States Artist Fellow. We're so honored to have Fred Moten here tonight, and please join me in welcoming him up to the podium. Uh, thank you very much. Um, appreciate everybody staying so late. It's been a beautiful day, but it's a long day too. So, uh, no, 
you shouldn't apologize because um, it's been worth it. Um, I hope, uh, you know, I can, I'm not sure if I can, but I'm gonna try my best to, to fold myself into the beauty of the day um, and disappear there. But, um, uh, but I also wanna, I really wanna thank you, Dottie, for inviting me and thank Gavin and Hannah and then everybody who spoke today, um, Myung and Wayne and Tracy, Raquel, um, Aria, Brandon from afar. Um, uh, man, I know I'm forgetting people, huh? Ken and, um, and Anais, so, um, and Cecilia, of course. So, uh, you know, I, I I'm trying to break the habit of that apology thing, so I'm just gonna read. Um, but I will say that what I, what I have here today is, um, it was sort of written for two occasions, um, two things that I kind of got invited to at the same time. So definitely this one, but another one too. I read an earlier version of it once, but I worked on it a lot since then. So, but it's also part of a, a larger project that itself is sort of wrapped within a larger project. And so there's this kind of weird way in which, you know, here I am again saying the same thing I always say. <laughs> so, um, sorry. Um, okay, this is called Recess and Nonsense. Um, the end of the poetry world and the ends of the poet. It's, it's 11 parts, um, which I didn't realize it was gonna be 11 until I saw that I could make it 11. And stuff that comes in 11s is usually good. Um, one, in whiteness as property, Cheryl Harris produces an analysis of whiteness as a property, as a mode of property, as something that can be owned and traded and placed in exchange to the advantage of the one who owns it. In so doing, she allows and requires us to think of whiteness not only as a mode of property, but also as the principle of property. If whiteness is the principle of property, blackness is the animaterial sufferance of impropriety. More plus less than either property's objection or abjection, blackness is the critique of property on the one hand and the celebration of dispossession on the other. This other hand means the critique is anticipatory, that it is not only before what it critiques, but that it brings what it critiques into something almost like existence. In turn, what Karen Barad might call the intraactive both-andedness of anticipation instantiates celebration not only as enjoyment, but also as solemnity. Given the brutality of property's belated, reactionary, regulatory power, there has been no more terrible burden than to be enjoined to celebrate dispossession. When possession is the motivation and constitution not only of the world, but of the very idea of world, earthly existence must bear a homelessness that no person, if the theory of personhood is to be believed, can bear. In this regard, neither hoping or even fighting for a place in this world, nor any gesture or movement towards the otherworldly will do. This is all to say that to say that whiteness is the principle of property is to say that the modality in which whiteness can live or the modality in which whiteness is endured or survived is spatial. This is, in turn, to say that whiteness isn't just a venal, brutal, vicious way of taking up space. Whiteness is rather the way in which so-called subjectivity is constructed as spatial or, more precisely, as spatio-temporal coordination. So that whiteness is, in its partiality, um, so that whiteness, in its partiality, is also manifest immediately, as it were, as a brutal way of taking up or taking other people's time. But to be a subject, to be a person, to be white, 
isn't just to take up space time in a fucked up way. What's at stake rather is that confluence where whiteness, subjectivity, and spatial temporality as such converge, constitute one another, and are given in that mutual constitution as being in the world. One special way to describe that confluence, special because it is a deep intensification of the exaltation and shame that goes with it, is being a poet, which is to say being a citizen of the world of poetry. Blackness in its inveterate earthliness is more plus less than that too. Two, I guess you could say that if whiteness is the transcendental aesthetic, then blackness is the eminent aesthetic. But this is too stark. Blackness isn't a pole. It's an impure refusal of bipolarity. We angels of dust, after all, and we can't forget the asymmetries of sovereignty, its Apollonian isolation, its sociopathic singularity, the optic whiteness of its whiteness, its tendency to be or go rogue. States don't have a right to exist. Do peoples? Do people, do persons have such a right? Do poets? Perhaps existence obliterates the economy of rights. Can persons be self-determining? Are atoms self-determining? Does the kind of determinism that Einstein and Bohm desire imply something on the order of a more broadly physical self-determination of and in nature? Are these two kinds of determination cognate? These are questions of black study, given in the open idiom of black poetry. What is revealed in their iteration is that there is no ontological, aesthetic, political, physical, or metaphysical fundament whose rest black study does not disturb. Three, Jay Carter asks, quote, what are the God terms that underwrite human, political, aesthetic sovereignty, end quote. But what if the question is rather, what are the man terms that underwrite sovereignty? Why did man become God? What protocols of what Sylvia Winter might call overrepresentation serially reproduces, reproduce this collective psychosis, which for fun, you could call Anselm's mirror stage. Anselm the saint, I mean, not Anselm the bear again, however saintly he may be. What if the first step is the assumption of a body? What is it, Gail Solomon, to assume a body, to take up a body, to take onto oneself a body, for the body and the self to take one another on? What remains beyond that address? What if that address, that aggressively impossible refusal of vulnerability, that projective settlement is sovereignty? And what if the taking up or on of whiteness is, as it were, a step within that step that is continually reactivated when property imposes and supervises the giving and taking of properties and names? Meanwhile, riot, mutiny, the general strike, the remorseless working, the undercommon tragic comedy, its antinomian swerve and quarrel, living's dissolute spread, its dispersive largesse, its transubstantial fade seems always already to have been a black thing you wouldn't understand because it passeth understanding. Can we speak then and appositionally to some insubstantial pageantry of the phonically anasubstantial? Are substance and sovereignty so bound up with one another, substance being the real physical matter, that which has mass, occupies space, is on time's line? that we have to imagine something like an unreal or more properly a surreal physical matter so we, can get, so we can get the body, which is to say the man off our back. Hortense Spillers and Toni Morrison teach us that flesh is surreal physical matter, that it neither has nor occupies. So that what's at stake is the necessity of a more emphatic inhabitation of flesh as something other than withdrawn or withheld or reduced body as that which is therefore opposed to body, to the aesthetics of po or poetics of self that is the body's assumption and vampiric animation. For poetics of flesh, 
Four poetics of selflessness. One wants to speak of, through, as flesh, in its own terms, but flesh has no terms, and one can't speak. Having no mass, flesh is the critical celebration of the mass. Flesh is displacement, that transformational gravitational warp. Flesh is the nonsense of the irreducibly consensual, the cenobitic jam. Flesh is recess. Four. Another sacrament is at hand, on a hand other than the political ecclesiastical performativity of ingestion. What did Anselm mean by debt? Here's where moratorium comes into play, a recess, a postponement, a refusal to settle accounts instantiates an already given sociality, a blurring, Nathaniel Mackey might say creaking of the word given in and as the disavowal of ends when the unpayable, the unsettlable is announced as radical disruption of the very idea of accounting, of accountability, of the account. Debt and death ring out like a horn's inhabitants. One bare silence come back in breathy thicknesses to tell us that assuming a body is like exhuming a body or ingesting a body, only bloodier. You can't take this. This is not my body, ain't nobody here, not here. In this displacement, we flesh, love that, claim this miracle. Five, for an analytic of radical dissatisfaction of the generally and radically unsatisfactory, I know why we're justified in claiming home, self, body, but the justification doesn't make it right. And what we claim ain't good just because we claim it. A state's existence isn't a function of right or rights. Its existence is a function of might, which then appeals to a logic of rights, of justification embedded in the brutalization it extends and attempting to negate it. But that state's justification doesn't translate into its right to exist. If there were a right to exist, wouldn't it be predicated on what you've done rather than any possible argument regarding why you are? And yet, what could any sovereign entity ever do to justify its existence? This is not a philosophical question about what might happen. This is an under philosophical question about what has happened. How do we come to accept what we already know about the already existing and about what we need? How do we consent to what we are and what we need? Six. I love black people too much to be around them at school but I want to be around them everywhere. I love black people in an absolutely anabiological way, but I don't care about the black community, which is an artifact of exclusion for which I have neither nostalgia nor desire. If I say this to you, it's only because they won't let me say it to them while they chant social justice in public by themselves. I'm only talking to you right now if you think I am or if you think you are. Who all here have allowed for that? To consent to the gravitational pull of a specific analysis that comes out of a series of interlocking exclusions, but is irreducible to those exclusions, and is rather given and instantiated in a set of erotic practices, would mean not only to acknowledge an already given and constantly regenerated and regenerative blackness, but also to take up an open set of specific designs on engaging in those erotic practices. This complex modality of consent is the very opposite, the very destruction of inclusion and of whatever entity or polity or community that would have the vile, brutal, murderous, expansionist colonial intention to include or be included, where community attenuates rather than attends. We're talking about a mutual gravitational field or influence or deeper still entanglement that admits of no prior separation, but insists on what Denise Ferreira da Silva calls difference without separation. Meanwhile, the sovereign body is the incarceration of difference. It plays and replays itself as individuated mourning for lost community like a ham bone made of plastic. There's a deep commitment to the settler's vicious longing for welcome, and poets can make it sound good. 
7. Can difference without separation survive realness? Only, perhaps, if realness is productively misunderstood as passing through rather than passing as the real, which is to say as its impossibility. What if, on the one hand, there really is nothing like the real thing, and on the other hand, there really is nothing like the real thing? Real thing is as practically redundant as sweet thing. The real race, the race race, it's a race thing. This real thingliness is suitable in its repetition for percussion. The question of what it is to be real is bound up with the question of what it is to be a thing among things. But this problematic of passing through the real, which is movement through the general problematic of the law of genre in order to think its recomposition, its improvisation, but in a richly redoubled real ass way, such that every invocation of the real is, as in Aretha's cover, which gives premature birth, as it were, to Marvin's and Tammy's original, a surreal, unreal, covering and uncovering and recovering and discovering of it. Therein would lie a declaration that there's no such thing as a static, statist conception, that there ain't nothing like that, that in passing through the real thing, which is nothing like the real thing, we become no things, or what De Silva calls no bodies against the state in their exhaustion of impossibility. Eight, what if entanglement is a consequence of the idea of photoelectric wave particle duality and quantum mechanics that actually troubles that duality and then those mechanics? If space-time and its laws break down at the subatomic level, breaking down here indicating a dance whose black queerness turns out to refuse any sense of separation between the very small and very large, then how do we judge the realness of space-time? Maybe we just pass through the slits in it, the propulsive and repulsive contact between the classical and the quantum having required us to suspend judgment in a general sense or at least to fastidiously qualify every judgment with, with J.S. Bell's acronym FAP, which is, for all practical purposes, just a Scottish version of the Ohio player's FOP. And even then, what if there is a more general and practical social and aesthetic purpose to which this, co this ritual caveat is inadequate? What if entanglement not only problematizes the idea of wave-particle duality, understood as a system, as a composite mental apparatus, but of prior separation and discretion as well. Here, I know that I am either radically misunderstanding or radically disturbing or simply obsessively applying even Bell's deconstruction of the opposition of system and apparatus, his dissatisfaction ultimately with the constitutive, decisive power that is given to measurement and the concomitant reduction of thinking to measurement if one desires to consider that the confluence of quantum mechanics and entanglement or non-locality revives Parmenides' formulation that it is the same thing to think and to be. What if then we are allowed and required to think the concepts of wave or particle or wave particle systemic duality as apparatuses rather than as systems in and of physical reality? So that the very conceptualization of that which is to be measured is itself an apparatus that is constitutive of the very activity of measurement. What if the richness and complexity that appeal to duality is meant to preserve can only be preserved by way of a movement through that duality so thoroughgoing that it destabilizes the very idea of measurement through which the duality is instantiated? What if there's an anomic animus that throws off iambic stride? The disruption of normative dispensation or allotment or apportionment or measure immeasurable, uncountable number, a wronging or ringing of the word, an essential and constitutive criminality in the word, the immeasurable from which measure flows, verse fugitive both from itself and freedom, thereby disregarding every prosaic and presidential precedent. The metaphysics of fascism is this, 
absence of choice given in the proliferation and imposition of irrelevant choices. Let's take a time out from all that. Recess to escape discretion either as the determination of the observer or as the self-determination of the observed, structured in whatever opposition, relation of wave and particle. The break, the hollow, the holler, the ditch, the dungle, the good foot, the mutron. Nine. Poetics is the difference between whatever it is that you think you have to say and whatever it is that language does. Or, poetics is the relation and the difference between content and form. Or, poetics thinks and enacts the differences that constitute the relation between content and form. For example, Claudia Rankin has an auditory signature, a sound, the microtonal oscillation between defeat and its deferral. But does she have a poetics? Citizen is an exhausting, exhaustive proof that the citizen is exhausted. It follows from Don't Let Me Be Lonely, which proves the impossibility and radical undesirability and irreducible loneliness of sovereignty and underprivilege of self-possession. But is it a proof or a restatement of a proof? An iteration of the already proven that doesn't so much make it more elegant or succinct, but rather signs it, or in another sense, takes up the assignment of signing for it or co-signing for it, sharing a kind of investment in the subject slash citizen's constant and irreducible melancholic attachment to itself as loss. Rankin has something else to say about a seemingly general and unavoidable cathexis to the impossible and the undesirable. Perhaps what's at stake is that evidentiary, post-conceptual forensic thing. Let me write you a song about all that shit you did. I'll put it in blue notes and broken English and cross you. But can I cross you without crossing over? We both at the airport. Why wouldn't you like that shit as much as me? I don't mean to be mean. I know you mean well. But what if eating the Wall Street Journal commits to a kind of initiatory ingestion in order to prove a point that ain't worth proving? Another evidentiary gesture towards what we already know. When will knowing what they've done as how we feel reach the point where it no longer needs to be proved? Why do we continually submit ourselves to this trial, an endlessness for which we volunteer as an application for admission? When will we break free of the annular advancement and critique of this restrictive notion of the evidentiary? Sometimes it feels like we're tired of feeling like that. But can we imagine imagining what exists? Can we get to the imaginary evidence of our existence? Why can't we see or hear that we'll never see or hear our animate and objectified bodies within the aesthetical juridical frame? Rankin's generosity comes in taking these questions on as if they were hers alone, as if they were inscribed upon her person or essential to her own unique description. To address these questions by way of, rendering, by way of a rendering of them that would be precise enough to unask them requires escape from the critique of judgment. There's still something left to give up, the desire to be seen in order to see the desire to ingest in order to expel, the desire to indict and pass sentence, hand in and out of hand on the other hand, the jurist generative mobilizes imaginative evidence outside the aesthetical juridical frame. And so we have to sing this song that Rankin has all but surreptitiously written called On Nothing in Citizen, which is the dispossessive non-locality of a dispossession the poet's and the poem's disappearance into an essay on poetics. 10. See, there's a recess in Citizen, an invitation Rankin extends. Recess is where the music, the music poetry, the musique comes from. Poetry finds, poetry founds. Out of airy nothing, poetry finds and founds nothing at all. Is there a logic of poetic discovery, an analyrics of entanglement that is not in memoriam of identity? 
a poetics of the unparticular. It's not that there's nothing more or nothing new to be said about antisociality, i.e. the crowded but solitary anti and anti vestibular stall wherein Brownian selves, Brown study themselves between mutually assured destruction and mutually destructive realization. It's that nothing more and new need be said. Poetry is not for something else to be said about things. Poetics is not the bridge between whatever someone has to say and the fact that something else is said. Nothing more and new need be said. Poetry is recess. It says nothing in praise of nothing, constantly, serially, fugally. If you think this is all nonsense, you flatter me to the point of my disappearance. 11. Nonsense is erratic trajectory, erotic in its refusal of narrow representations of representation, and with the complex interplay between nothingness and thingliness, the paraontological field within which the distinction between nothing and everything is constantly improvised. Blackness is situated in the sensuality of the nonsensical rather than in the already given supersensuality of the epidermal. Insofar as the critique of authenticity is paradoxically or paradoxically asserts a right of property in as individuation in the real world, it is in essence often nothing more than a disavowal of existential, consensual nonsense, which is not just one difference among others, but is precisely the field within which the general right to difference is both theorized and enacted as world's earthly and annihilative surrealization. Consider that the supposed relation between color and sense is often treated as a sociological matter. That's how we study, for instance, the ways that epidermal differences, which are manifest not only in the color, but in the volume of one's skin, have been so often aligned with having or not having sense, betraying pigment's conceptual detachment from what it is supposed to mark which allows it to be deployed as uniform, livery, garment, and name. Under this constraint, the analytic, as well as the counter-analytic of the epidermal, elides what it also illuminates. And there's a difference, and there's also a relation between sharing the social costs that attend epidermalization and distributing the benefits that accrue to senses irreducibly material and differential material supplementarity. Both can be spoken of in terms of privilege, but often the color line between privilege and, proca and precarity is drawn with imprecision. When privilege is understood simply to accrue to a supposedly unmarked, paradoxically bare whiteness, it is not only privilege, but also whiteness, which is situated at the intersection of good sense and brutality that is misunderstood. The operation within which I am held to and by which I am given, into and out of which I am unfolded, and the particular impersonation from which the sounds you hear right now derive, which I would associate with illicit seeing, with multiple sensing, with black theory, which is to say theory, with black history, which is to say history, is in the nonsensical. Nonsense is sometimes manifest as a kind of happiness, and, the, and this capacity to be happy, to celebrate, is a condition of possibility of criticism's necessary unhappiness. What we have, insofar as we give it away, lets us know what and under what conditions we should have. What we have and what we should have is nothing other than the consensually nonsensical generality of a recessive trait by way of which the poet retreats into the hesitant sociality and sociology of blackness and poetry. Thanks.
you don't have to have any questions. <laughs> Here just to save the day or the night. Um, maybe just a general view. Um, everyone here seems to be used to this mix of poetry and theory, but maybe just your take on it. And one thing that I thought is unusual in your writing, you're also from other people who use the same method, is that you're also addressing the readers or the listeners. Um, you're saying I and if you understand or if you listen. So maybe just if you can say something about that method and unusualness of combining the highly philosophical ideas with personal address. Uh, well, I don't know, I, I just grew up in a neighborhood where that's how people talked, you know. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's just, uh, uh, and I also, you know, I mean, I'm, I mean, I, I mean, I would say that that what I just read, you know, is is an academic essay. So, which is to say, you know, I have a job and I work in the university, and they call me a teacher, and I've been trying really hard to figure out how to do that. And over the last two or three years, I realized that the best way to do that is to not do that. But nevertheless, you know, I'd be trying to talk with, you know, my students. We try to talk about things. Um, and I usually talk too much. And I'm trying to figure out how to not do that. But, but everything I've ever written pretty much for the last 25 years has been in preparation for teaching, which has been therefore preparation to try to talk with people, which too often turns into talking to people, but, but I'm working on that, you know. Um, and uh, when I say it's an academic, I really mean it in this very specific sense, which is that the academy is a kind of a, it's a project for people who can't afford to live where they live. Um, <laughs> you know, um, I, I don't, I don't know. Will I still be an academic when I go home tonight? I don't know. I live on, on, at NYU. It's like, I don't know if I'm gonna ride a cab or if I'm gonna take the subway, but how far away do I have to get from Columbia to not be in the, in the academy? Are all the people who got displaced from Harlem no longer in the academy? Or are they in fact utterly held within the academy? You know, I don't know. I mean, um, that inside outside thing is, is problematic. And to recognize it as problematic is not, I think, to indulge in despair. It's just to, sometimes I feel like these analytics that we have about the academic versus the, the non-academic are like, um, they have the same level of kind of precision as chemotherapy, you know? Um, they burn up what they're supposed to heal, you know? And, um, and somehow that inside-outside thing ends up working as a kind of combination of cancer and the chemotherapy, you know? And so I just feel like everything's much more complicated and, and requires a much higher level of precision. Um, whereas, wherein, and by precision I mean, you know, lyricism, you know? So, um, I'm just blathering, man, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to answer your question, I don't know. I mean, it's like, it 
we all just, I just don't see anything that we don't need, you know? So we need a lot of different ways to talk, you know? And we really need to be able to, to hang out with one another and hear all those different ways that people have to talk. Um, um, so it's just another way to talk, you know? Um, and, and, and maybe it'll, it'll be helpful to, to somebody, you know? So just doing the best I can, <laughs> you know, so. It's just, it's, come on. Okay. I hate asking questions, so this is so ironic. Well, first of all, an observation that I already shared with Ken, which is that this building is so crazy because when you look at the window, it's like Columbia created a constellation from the lights. So it's like they made the sky as well as the land. But anyway, sorry, I got really nervous all of a sudden. Um, thank you. Um, so I just have a question sort of building on your question, which is how do you listen? Because I love listening to you, but how do you listen? Because you have to listen to write, right? It depends on who you ask. Cause if you go to my house and ask them, they'll probably say not very well. <laughs> you know? but, um, no, but that's what I mean. It's situational. Yeah. Like listening is situational, right? Uh, no, I mean... Um, See, the, the trouble is, the trouble is, there's like a thing that happens, you know, where you feel almost like a kind of uh, sense of accomplishment that borders on hubris. And it kind of comes with this feeling that you have of being able to answer any possible question. <laughs> it's, it's terrible, it's like a horrible thing. So I feel like I can answer your question, you know, I mean, and, and make it seem good, you know. Um, <laughs> but I don't know. I'm trying to learn. I know that there have been, you know, I just, I grew up in a house, you know, that, that was filled with music. You know, and my mom was really into jazz. And, and I've read a lot of things that jazz musicians say about the necessity of listening and the inseparability of listening and playing, that these are kind of a steady state system in a way, um, that to play is to listen or to play well is to listen well. Uh, and it is a kind of an almost, uh, it's like a fundamental kind of responsiveness, you know? Um, and openness and, and vulnerability. Um, again, you know, Karen Barak would call it responsibility, you know, this, 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 this absolute, so to speak, ability to respond. Um, and so I could say, all I can really say is that that's maybe, that's what I would, that's what I aspire to, but, but I know I'm not even close. You know, um, so really, actually, if, if, if they, in my house, they would tell you badly and I pretty much have to say the same thing, but I'm trying to learn how to listen better. Um, and I hope I do, you know, <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, I hope I do. I'm trying, I'm essaying, you know, <laughs> which is now officially a verb in the English, in the, in the English tongue. So, uh, so. 
you. Uh, thank you so much. It was so beautiful. Uh, I'm wondering, you spoke about um, this possession and this dissatisfaction, and I'm wondering how they both, uh, in your mind, uh, played out in in in, the, in poetic language, in poetic form, uh, and how you uh, express uh, or celebrate this possession, uh, or even radical loss, uh, as it comes to identification and all the subject that you raised up here. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I think maybe when I use the word dispossession, I'm kind of always in my mind seeing it with like a, like a little line or a slash or something between the prefix, you know, and the root in the sense that, I mean, Look, I mean, there's a very specific way in which I could sit up here and say, well, being black in America, you know, I have this experience or I have this trace, this mark, you know, on, on my body or in my person. And it's a mark which ultimately undermines any kind of claim I would actually have to having a body or having a person, being a person. And that that mark comes from what it means literally to, to have been property, you know? Um, and I could make this claim as if it were a special claim, but, um, but I don't, it's the only difference I suppose would be maybe I have much smaller access to anything that would allow me to think that I can't that I that I can't make that claim. And there's a lot of people running around thinking that 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 they don't have the ability to make that claim, but they just haven't thought about it hard enough yet. Okay. Um, you know, it's like a Macbeth formulation, you know, man that is born of a woman or something like that. But but I think that uh but given that I can't disavow that claim, which is a claim on nothing, which is a claim on being unable to claim, a claim on being unable to have, a claim on being radically dispossessed of the very capacity to possess, you know, insofar as I can't not make that claim, um, I, I, I bear it with the intention of sharing it, okay? Because for me, that claim is the condition of possibility of another way of living on the earth. That's not owning it, but just trying to walk around gently on it as it, right? Um, so uh, in this respect, you know, um, it is also about the terror and the horror of having to claim being possessed, right? Um, which I don't take lightly or want to talk about it as if it were some easy thing. It's a terrible thing. You know what I mean? It's a terrible thing to be the descendants of those who are possessed and to have to claim being possessed, okay? Um, I can't think of anything more horrific, but I can't think of anything more likely to continually produce the chance of, you know, what Cecilia was calling emergence, you know? Uh, so, you know, that's, that's what we got. That's what I have to give, is not having, <laughs> you know? Um, that's all I got, that's all I can share. Um, but, uh, yeah. So. It makes me feel like crying to hear you, but your laugh wakes me up. You laugh so beautifully. It's just heartbreaking. But hearing you, I 
didn't want to be one asking a question, but I couldn't stop myself, is your use of the word recess. Hmm? Just speak some more of that choice, recess. Well, it's got a double edge to it in the sense that it can mean a, you know, a, a, a break, a, a stop, a, a sus, sus, uh, what's the word, uh, a ceasing, um, you know, a time for play, like recess in school. But it is also, I think, uh, I mean, I think about it topologically. A, a low place, uh, a hollow, or as they might say in Appalachia, a holler, you know, um, which therefore implies also a sound, um, uh, a, a topographical sounding, which is also a descent, a, a deepening. All those things for me are there, and, and you can hear it in the music all the time. Um, it's, uh, It's like, um, well, you know, James Brown is the great musician of the one, you know, that downbeat. But I always thought that it would be more accurate that, that every time he talks about the one or being on the one, he's really talking about being on the, on the zero. <laughs> like the, the one is just this sort of utterly temporary conceptual scheme from which one looks back on that which can't be named, which is that, that recess, that, that nothingness. So, um, and it's just a thing where it's just, you know, you listen to it, you listen for it. Um, and you know, for me, you know, that's where, that's where we, I wasn't gonna say that's where we are, and then I was gonna say that's where we come from, but maybe the best way to put it is, is that's where the difference between where we are and where we come from doesn't signify. Um, but, yeah. I mean, you know about it. <laughs> You've been doing it forever, right? So, and I mean that, you know what I mean? Forever, doing it before you got here, you know? So that's, that's what we do, that's how we do, you know? Um, <laughs> 